Good evening, Desert Hills. I want to thank you and welcome you all for being here tonight. For tonight is a special night. As Pastor has mentioned, we're going to be observing and partaking in the Lord's Supper. Um, he kind of already gave a warning. For those who do not believe in Jesus Christ, we ask that you not partake in this. For as the Bible says, if you do this unworthily, unworthily, you, you do this, you bring judgment onto yourself. But I hope by, after the nice message for those who do not believe in Jesus Christ, that do not know that he is the all-sufficient sacrifice for everyone in the whole world, that tonight be the night they come to that salvation. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for your love and your mercy. Lord, thank you for allowing us to come here tonight. Lord, I pray that you are heard and seen here. And as always, if anybody here does not know you, does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, may tonight be the night that they find salvation and hope. Lord, we love you. May you have your way here tonight on this special night. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So I want you guys to travel back with me 2,000 years. We're going all the way back 2,000 years. We're going to Jerusalem, and we're with Jesus and the disciples. He had just come into Jerusalem for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the Passover. And what we're going to find here is our king is going to be sitting with his disciples, celebrating the Passover, which he had done in old times. But he wasn't really there to celebrate in all the festivities like everyone else was. He was there to give himself up for a ransom. He was there to be sacrificed on our behalf. <sighs> We're going to be reading in Luke chapter 22, verses 7 to 20. So let's start there. Luke 22, if you guys will turn there with me, starting verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed or sacrificed. And he said, and he, Jesus, sent Peter and John, saying, Go, prepare us the Passover, that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there should be a man, um, there should be a man meet you, bearing a, a, a pitcher of water. Follow him to the house where he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room, furnished there, make ready. And they went, and they found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. 
For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new, te- this cup is the new testament, the new covenant, if you will, of my blood, which is shed for you. My friends, what we're going to do here tonight, we do this in remembrance of what he did for us, for all of humanity. Jesus Christ went to the cross and died that we might have life. And I wish I didn't have to say it that way, that we might have life. But sadly, not everyone will accept or choose Jesus Christ. This gift that is offered is only given to those that will receive who come to the believing knowledge that Jesus Christ is the son of God who went to the cross for the whole world, past, present, and future. So here we see our king having a supper, a a feast, if you will, of what God had done in the past, sparing the Jews. So what what they were spared from was, was... was the torment, the persecution, and the lock that Pharaoh and Egypt had on them. They were in bond. They were in bondage, okay? God sent all these plagues to them, sparing them the whole time. And he's getting ready to send one more plague, and that was death. And it was going to come through all the land of Egypt and take all the firstborn male and beast, So let's go back further. Let's go all the way back to the time of Moses. Turn with me, if you will, to Exodus chapter 12, please. So we're back in Egypt. The Lord has just done marvelous work for the people of of Israel. Not so much for the Egyptians. There's a lot of sorrow going on right now in this time. A lot of bad things are happening. And one more bad thing is about to happen. Again, he's sending death to come take every firstborn male and beast. But he tells Aaron and Moses, Aaron, I'm sorry, Moses and Aaron. Again, chapter 12, starting in verse three. The Lord tells them, speak unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, in the 10th day of the month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb and your lamb shall be without blemish. It shall be choice. It should be perfect. Without blemish, a male of the first year, you should take it out from the sheep or from the goats and ye shall keep it up until the fourth day of the same month and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take it, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house, wherein they shall eat. Please skip down with me to verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both men and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord." And the blood shall be for you a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, a remembrance. And ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. What we see here is a foreshadow of what God is going to do with Jesus Christ for the whole world. What was done here was for the chosen people, for the Jews. What was to come was for us all. My friends, Jesus Christ is our new Passover. He is the perfect lamb we read about in verse 5. For out of all 
the man ever born in this world, he's the only sinless one. For his father was truly God. His mother was an earthly woman. All of us come from the, back, from the lineage of, 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 of Adam, the fallen man, but not Jesus Christ. He was the perfect lamb. And just as the Lord said, have the whole congregation shall kill it. That's what we did. Our sins sent him to that cross. And that's a hard thing to swallow. But our sins, for those who choose to believe in him and for those who do not choo uh, choose to believe in him, he went to the cross regardless for all of our sins. Make no mistake, there is no other way. There is no other way to be spared from what's coming. Now, what was coming for them was death, just for the firstborn and for the beast. We all must taste death, but we don't have to taste the sting, amen? We have hope through Jesus Christ because, again, he is our Passover. So when we die and we're up there on the day of judgment, there's two places you go, my friends. You go either with, with, with God the Father to heaven or you're cast away from him into eternal darkness, which is hell. My friends, we can be spared. We can be spared destruction with the blood of Jesus Christ, but that blood must be over the doorpost of your heart. Amen. Without accepting Jesus Christ as the all-sufficient sacrifice, then we have no hope. We have no hope. And we will be without the Father, which again is hell. My friends, Turn back with me to Luke chapter 22. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I imagine Jesus Christ, he was telling the disciples why he had to go there. But I don't think it really, really struck a chord yet. Because they hadn't seen it, you know. And I don't think some of them really believed it was going to happen. But he knew why he was there. And he wasn't there for the festivities. He was there to give us life. He was there to make things right. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper saying, this, uh, this cup is the new Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. We do this in remembrance of what God has done for us. What has God done for us? God has healed the sick. He's made the blind to see again. He's, he's caused the crippled to walk. He's cast out demons. He's fed the hungry with the word of God, with the, with the living word, with the living manna. He's brought back the dead, and he's given us hope. Those are nice things, huh? Let's remember Let's remember the bad thing, which is good for us, but the punishment he had to take on for us. Those are all beautiful things. And I'm not saying him going to the cross isn't beautiful. It was, but he paid a price for us. You guys, um, as much as I went over this, you know, I'm going to try not to cry too much, but um, we're going to be in Mark chapter 15, if you will. And we're going to be looking through verses 12 to 39. And we're going to remember what he did for us that day on the cross. Again, turn with me, please, if you will, to Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 12. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, Well, what will ye then that I shall do unto him who ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, crucify him. And Pilate said unto them, why? What evil has he done? And they cried out more, exceedingly crucify him. You know what's missing from this picture? 
So here's Pilate on the stage. There's Jesus. And there's all of Israel. There's, there's the Jewish people. What's missing in this picture is all of us in the crowd with the Jewish people. Our sins sent him to the cross. We might not have been there, but we were there saying, crucify him. So Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas, a known killer and thief. Released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus to be scourged. And delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. My friends, he puts Jesus through a Roman flogging, which you've been, you've heard, most of you have heard here before. It's a whip that has an extension of nine extra, uh, uh, it's called a cattail, or, or, or the cat of nine tails. Thank you, Pastor. And this, this whip had nine extensions, and it was probably braided up, and it whooped the back of our king. And then afterwards, they sent him to go get crucified. I've watched documentaries about crucifixion. They say when a body's up there, they're pressed down and they have to pick themselves up to breathe. And our master was doing that with a whooped up back. Now, I don't know if that wood was sanded or if it had, but can you imagine your know, whooped up back? They didn't do it lightly too, they beat his back. Can you imagine him putting himself up there to say what he had to say? I can't. And the soldiers that led him away in the hall called Praetorium. And the soldiers led him away into a hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole band. And they clothed him with purple and plated a crown of thorns and put it on his, about his head and began to salute him, hail the king of the Jews. And they smote him in the head with the reed and they did spit upon him, bowing their knees and worshiping him. So now they start to mock your king. They take their sticks and they start to whip him in his face. Mind you, that crown of thorns on there, not only are they beating up his face, but I imagine that crown and those thorns are just digging into his head. And they spit on him and they mock him. But they did not know that he was there for them. Because I think if they would have, they would have never done any of those things. They took those reasons and they whacked our king in the face after they bloodied his back. They mocked him, they spit on him. Continuing verse 20. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him and put on his own, cl and put, put on his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. And they compelled one Simon, a, a, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And they bring him unto a place, uh, Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of skull. They brought the king of life to a place of death. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. And when they had crucified him, when they put one nail in one hand and the other in the next, and then in between his feet, Mind you, after they beat his back and they beat his head, they beat his face. I don't know about you guys. I'm in construction. I get a lot of cuts. I can't imagine a nail being driven through my hands, my feet, let alone everything else we just read that our King and our Savior had done for us. And, at, and when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them that every man should take. And the superscription of his accusation was written over the king of the Jews, the king of us all. And with him, they crucified two thieves, 
one on the right hand and one on the other, and, and one on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. He had no reason to be up there but for us. He had no reason to be up there but for us. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads, saying, Ah, thou destroy the temple and build it in three days? Save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priest, mocking, said among themselves, with the scribes, he saved others, himself he cannot save? He could have saved himself. But how loving and gracious would that have been? for our God towards us. Don't think one minute that he couldn't come down from that cross. He could have. But he loves you. Amen. And he stayed up there for you. Amen. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him revealed, reviled him. Excuse me, forgive me, everyone. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabbathani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them stood by, and when they had heard it, said, Behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave it to him drink to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. It's as if God's hands came down and ripped this massive thing. Because Jesus Christ is our New Testament. You don't have to sacrifice animals no more. You just have to believe in what Jesus Christ did on the cross. That's it. And when the centurion, which stood over, uh, stood over against him, saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. My friends, we cannot do it on our own. There is no new way coming. It's been done. It's been done. And that is Christ on the cross. My friends, we are fallen sinners. But we have a risen Savior. Amen. My friends, we're all going to die. We're all going to stand before the throne of God. Will, will, will that blood, will his blood, that precious blood, Will it be over you? Will that, will that punishment pass over you? Only if you have Jesus Christ. Only if you have Jesus Christ. Again, we do this in remembrance of what he has done for us. Luke 15, and he said unto them, with desire, I have desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. My friends, let us always remember day to day what he has done for us. The hope that he has put inside of the believer. My friends, it's as easy as confessing to God, inward and or outward, that I am a sinner and I believe you sent Jesus Christ to the cross to pay for my debt. It's that easy, my friends. That's the end of my message. I hope this has brought remembrance of what a good, mighty God has done for us and why we observe this new Passover. The Lord's Supper is because he is worthy. He is worthy and he has given us hope, hope everlasting. My friends, if there's anybody in this room or listening that does not know Jesus Christ, Right now is the time for salvation. Grab hold of Jesus Christ. Confess your sins to God. Confess that you believe in Jesus Christ. And watch, watch that destruction pass over you. God is not a liar. 
He's a holy God. He cannot lie. His word is true. But you must have Jesus Christ.